I get a little excited sometimes. I'm not going to apologize for it, but I do get excited because I know what I used to be. I know what I am, and I know why I am, where I am in life, is all because of the Lord. Amen. And that's all there is to it. It's plain and simple, just like that. You know, the, the, the interesting thing about preaching, what amazes me about, about the art of preaching is this, is that God can use anybody, any willing body, to get up behind a pulpit or any stand, wherever, be a nursing home, a church, anywhere it is, God can give a message to the preacher. The preacher has no idea what's going on in people's lives. No clue what's going on. And God gives a message to that preacher. Somehow, it's a miracle of God every Sunday that the preacher is able to preach a message that the Lord uses to get to people's hearts, right? And it's that, that Bible is really something powerful, people. hope we know that. That's a powerful book we have, uh, we have with us here this morning. And uh, I, I tell you what, uh, the Lord uh, reveals uh, to me His goodness. It seems like every time I preach and I, I, I pray uh, multiple times, because I know without Him, this message is nothing without Him, right? And uh, it's amazing to me every time that I... Um, you know, the, the feedback that people, you know, say to me, like, you know, thank you for the message. I, you know, got this out of it. And it's like, wow, that's incredible to me, you know. Um, and I know there's uh, other preachers that I've spoken to as well. And they say, you know, people came up to me afterwards and they said, uh, they said that they got this out of the message. It's like, I didn't even preach about that. How did you get that out of the message? You know what I mean? It's like, because that's the power of the Holy Spirit working, right? Um, I came across a story last night. A story last night I literally just stumbled over. I went for a walk, and uh, last night I got home, and uh, on the walk I was doing some thinking and stuff like that, and, and uh, I came across a story by accident, and I thought, you know what, this might be pretty fitting for the message here this morning. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I mean, it was very recent, there was a, a gentleman that took his daughter out to uh, a Chick-fil-A restaurant, and I forget where it was, it could have been Texas, I honestly forget where it was. Uh, but he took his daughter out on a daddy-daughter date to a Chick-fil-A. And uh, he went there. They had a good time. They had some food. She played in a little indoor playground in there. And uh, they were just minding their own business. And um, all of a sudden, what they normally do is they go up. He goes up to the counter to get uh, their drinks re uh, topped off, right? And uh, this time what had happened was she went up with him to the counter. And uh, when they both went up to the counter, the, uh, they noticed a homeless man came walking in the store. Uh, and, ho you know, a complete bum-looking guy, you know, long hair, not, didn't smell very good from what the story was saying, right? And he said that the homeless man came in, and the store manager came out to him and asked him what, you know, what, what he could do to help or what he needed, and the homeless man said to him, he says, can I have some of your food scraps that you have here? And the store manager, to his surprise, said, no. I'm not going to give you any of the scraps here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a fresh meal that you can take home or take with you, right? A fresh meal just for you that you can take home. So in, online, there's a picture of... The store manager, uh, or the, the, this homeless man, holding a bag of food from Chick-fil-A. I don't know how much food was in there, but he gave the homeless man some warm food. He said, but only under one condition. You have to let me pray for you. You have to let me pray for you. And the homeless man agreed. So there's a picture online of this homeless man holding a bag of food from Chick-fil-A, and the store manager, who wasn't a very old guy, I can't tell exactly how old he was, could be in his 30s, his 40s, but he wasn't, he wasn't very old. Pretty young man. And you see him there with his head bowed, his eyes closed, and he's praying with his hand on the homeless man, and he's praying for him. Now, I don't know if this <clears throat> store manager is a born-again Christian. I have no idea. Led to believe that he may be, okay? Being that bold in public, especially at work, a lot of employers would fire you for doing something like that, right? And so I, I looked at that, and I saw that, and I thought, you know what? The Lord means something to him. The Lord means so much to that young man that he's willing to give some food for free. Not that it's that big of a deal, right? Chick-fil-A can afford it, but that's not the point. But the man saw so much value in the Lord 
whatever his relationship is with the Lord, he saw so much value in the Lord that he said, you know what? This food that I'm going to give you is a temporary thing. But I'm going to pray for you. If you let me give you the food, I want to pray for you, kind of thing, right? And I thought about that, and, and I was, I, you know, it's kind of one of those things where as soon as something of that sort is made public, you always have people that have to be negative and negative and negative Nelly about it, right? It drives me crazy sometimes, but it is what it is. And people are saying, oh, that's what, you know, that's what the far-right Christian, Christ, Christian religious circle always has to do is shove their religion on people's throats, this and that. It's like, you know, if we had a little bit more prayer in the world today, we might have a little bit more peace going on in the world today, too. If we had a little bit more prayer, right? Yeah. This guy basically said, I don't really care what people think. I'm going to do this. He did it right in front of everybody. He didn't, you know, go off to the side and hide in a corner and pray like, oh, I hope nobody's watching me. He did it right there out in the open for everybody that, that could see it. And he says, I'm going to pray for you put his hand on the guy, prayed for him. And so the gentleman and his daughter that saw this happening, he looked, at, the daughter said to her dad, she said, Dad, what's going on? And, he's, and he told his daughter, he said, the store manager is praying for that homeless man right there. He said, sweetheart, this is why I like coming to Chick-fil-A, is because they actually care about people. And I will tell you this, of all the places that I've gone to and ate at, okay, I will tell you, and I'm not just saying it because, I'm, you know, because of this story, but I, I sincerely mean this. Chick-fil-A is one of the very few places, fast food places, that I choose to go to that when I go there, they're friendly and they're nice. They actually, they, even if they don't want you there, they do a pretty good job of acting like they want you there, <laughs> pretending, all right? I, I said that one time to my wife. I said, you know what, even if they don't want us here, they do a really good job of acting like it, you know, and that's cool. You know, even if you don't want me there, just act like you want me there. I'll be fine with that, right? <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, I came across that story last night because I was trying to work on an introduction for this message. I was kind of struggling with that. And I thought, you know, that might be a good one. That that man, that young man, saw enough value in the Lord to not care what other people thought about him. What people might think. Oh, you're just pushing your religion in, your, in the workplace. That man said, I don't care about all. I don't care what people say, what they do. I don't care. He put his job on the line, in a sense, right? Even though the people that run Chick-fil-A are Christian people, he still put his job on the line, in a, in a, in a sense, right? He said, I don't care what people think. I'm just going to do it, because this man needs it, right? All right. This morning, if you would, I want you to go to the book of Ephesians. We're going to start out there. Book of Ephesians. I was in here a couple weeks ago, too, the book of Ephesians, preaching a message out of there. We're going to be in a similar passage, but a little bit different topic. The book of Ephesians, in chapter number 5, it says this. Ephesians chapter 5 says this in verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children... And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You know, earlier this week I was uh, praying and asking the Lord to guide me in this message and show me what to, what to preach on, and I, I forget how I came across this passage, but I came across that. And what stood out to me was this about that passage. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And that stood out to me. You know why? Because when I watch children playing around, having fun, you know one thing that they don't seem to have that we adults do seem to have is a fear for man when it comes to getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out. I've seen kids fearlessly walk up to people with tracks, handing them out left and right, talking to people, this and that. But half the time, sometimes for us adults, to go out of our comfort zone to give a track out because we know that the rejection more than likely may come to some extent. But, you know, I look at that piece of scripture right there. It says, be therefore followers of God as dear children. I think to myself, you know what? If we could be like children and be as happy and as giddy about the Lord, following the Lord as what children are, 
Because a lot of times what I see with Christians, man, I'm just going to put it out there this morning. I'm not trying to be mean. But sometimes I think to myself, I don't know what kind of Christianity it is that some of these people have, but I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm not trying to be mean. But, you know, the Bible tells us right there, be ye there for followers of God as your children. You know what children are? Children are happy. They're excited. They don't worry about the little things. Amen. They don't have anything to worry about. Because why? Mom and dad are going to take care of them. Well, guess who's going to take care of us? Our Heavenly Father. Amen. Right? right. Yep. So why can't we be more like children? Right. <laughs> be ye there for followers of God as dear children. Walking around... Who cares what people think? Who cares what they say? Do you actually expect people to have a come to Jesus moment every time you witness to them? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? When you go out to the street corners witnessing to people, do you think, praise the Lord, there is a God up there. Where have you been my entire life? <laughs> How many times have you seen that or experienced that? Me? Hmm, not much. What I usually get is, oh, I don't need that religion that you have. Well, you need something, because I'm looking at you, and you don't look too good today, right? <laughs> you need something. Maybe it's a bath, a good meal. I don't know what it is, but you need something, right? But I look at that, and that stood out to me. I thought, you know, Lord, why can't we as Christians stop worrying so much about what the world thinks of Christianity? Now, I will say this. We have done ourselves a great disservice over the years. We have done that. But I will tell you this, too. If we could be like little children, looking at God, saying, Lord, thank you for what I have, that you will let me serve you, be a part of this holy family. But you know what? We oftentimes get wrapped up in adults. The burdens and the weights of this present world that is not our home, and we have to remind ourselves of that stuff, we let all those weights, all those burdens stack upon our shoulders. The next thing you know, we're walking around dragging our feet like this. Hey, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Carrying this heavy load on our back, and then you wonder why nobody wants anything to do with you as a Christian. Why there's other people that are lost as can be look happier than we do, Right? One of the things that I'm learning in my relationship with the Lord is this. Stop worrying over every little thing that happens. Some things, it's just life. Some things just happen. Whether you're because you're a fool or you made a mistake. Right? Life just happens sometimes. It's quiet. I don't know. Maybe the Lord's dealing with people. I don't know. But it says this. Be, there, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Love. That's a powerful word. But let me tell you this. Love does not mean that you're going to agree with everything that somebody else does. Not everyone's going to agree with everything that you do. What I mean by that basically is this, okay? If you know people that are lost, if you're not accepting to their way of life, their sinful way of life. You're not accepting to that. What the world says, well, then you don't love them. That's not true. Love is giving them the truth. You love them so much, you want to give them the truth. Even if it hurts and it stings. When I was witness to, before I actually called upon the Lord to be saved, it hurt and it stung. That moment when the book, the Bible was opened up to me, and the Bible flat out told me right here, right now, on the spot, you're a sinner on your way to hell. That's what the Bible said. And the preacher just happened to be relaying the message from what the Bible was saying. Amen. And I said, wow, isn't that something? Well, I'm not like everybody else is. I don't care. God says, hold on a second. Who are you comparing yourself with? The world? Look at the world. Compare yourself with my word. You're going to come short of my glory every single time. Right? Right? But it says this here, it says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Amen. You know, it can be, if we're not careful, it can be, more of, can be more of a cliche when we say these things, but Jesus saves, right? 
And Christ laid his life down as an atonement for our sins. But so many people live every single day not even realizing or thinking about the fact that it could be their last day. And when Christ was on this earth, he walked in love. He walked as one that wanted to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? He wanted to see people get right. He wanted to see, even if you will, the religious crowd be rebuked because they were after, they were, uh, they were uh, uh, where am I going here now? The, the religious crowd basically, were, they're, uh, um, where am I going with this here now? Um, I don't know, let me go back up here. This happens every once in a while. Uh, it says here, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given, him, given himself for us. Christ gave himself for us as an offering to God, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But so many people are trying so hard every day to keep the commandments or be a good person to get their way into heaven. And every time somebody asks or tells me that, I ask them, how are you going to get to heaven when you die? Have you ever been saved? Have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? I try to keep it you know, short, sweet, and to the point. And they say, well, I'm going to be a good person. Okay, being a good person, how, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to keep the commandments. Okay, what are the commandments? Half the time, they don't even know what they are. They might be able to list off a few of them, not even in order. And I say, did you know there's over 600 of them in the Bible? Not just 10. There's over 600 commandments in the Bible, like 630-something, Right? Do you think you can keep all those? Do you think you can really keep every single commandment in the Bible? Let me tell you something. Paul tells us that the commandments, the law of God, was as a schoolmaster to bring us to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Christ fulfilled the law for us. There's nothing we can do. It's already been done. Why are we trying to work for it? Or those that are trying to work for it, why are you trying to work for it, right? But I'm going to show you this here. If you would, go over to uh, Acts. Acts chapter, let's go here, Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 6. Let's go to Acts chapter 6. I'm going to open this up with prayer. Father God, this morning, Lord, just want to commit this message over to you, Lord. Uh, Lord, you know what, what uh, your people need to hear this morning, where their hearts are at, Lord, and what's going on in people's lives. And Lord, I am, I am thankful that people uh, came this morning to hear the Word of God. Not hear me preach, but to hear the word of God preached. That's what I'm thankful for, Lord. That there's people that still have a heart to want to hear from you, Lord. Whether it's five people or 500 people, whatever the number is, Lord. I'm thankful for everybody here that you got uh, safely here this morning. Lord, I ask you to bless them for being here. I ask you to show them something from your word this morning that would help them in their walk with you. That, Lord, you would get the glory, the honor, and the praise. And that would cause your people to want to draw closer to you. Lord, it's very easy for us in this world that we live in as Christians. It is so easy for us and tempting for the things of this world to get our attention, to get our heart. Next thing you know, we're in a backsliding stage and we're far from you, Lord. I pray that if there's anybody here this morning, Lord, that that is maybe in a backsliding stage or just maybe somebody that needs to be saved this morning, maybe some encouragement, Lord, that you would meet those needs here this morning, Lord. As we take a look at something here this morning, as an individual in the Bible, Lord, who laid his life down for you, Lord. I pray that maybe it would spark a thought in somebody's mind here this morning. It would prick their heart. Lord, I just pray that you'd get me out of the way and that every word spoken here this morning would glorify and honor you, Lord. I pray if there's anybody lost in here today, Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation. They would once and for all put aside themselves, call upon you, and be saved. Lord, I ask these things and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 6 here, it says in verse number 1, it says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye up out, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man of full faith and of 
the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Taman, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. I'm going to read that again in verse number 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Where, they've got, where the word of God increased, guess what happened? Even the priests got saved. And verse number 8. And Stephen, full of faith, full of faith, not a quarter, not a half, a full of faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. They don't like what's being preached here. They don't like what they see happening. They don't like this. The word of God is increasing. Even the priests are coming to Christ. Oh, they don't like this, right? And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Verse number 12, have you ever been in a situation, this just came to mind, have you ever been in a situation where you're trying to witness to somebody, maybe a coworker, friend, neighbor, whoever it is, and the moment you start talking to them about Jesus Christ, the phone rings, or somebody mysteriously comes out of like thin air and says, hey, how's it going today, guys, and totally interrupts the conversation? Have you ever experienced that before, right? Man, and they stirred up the people. See, the people heard what was going on. They heard, they heard what Stephen had preached about, right? And what, what they didn't like about this was that it was going against everything that they had been taught previously, right? And so Stephen has preach, had, had preached this message, basically rebuking the religious zealots of the day, right? Looking back at this here, it says in verse number 12, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. They're confusing people. They're trying to mix things up. They don't like what he's preaching on, preaching Jesus. So what do they do? They're going around. They're trying to, stir, they're trying to get confusion, stir things up, stir the people up, trying to get people in mass confusion about what's going on, what's being preached here. And it says this in uh, verse number 13. It says, And set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that said in the council looked steadfastly on him. Now watch what it says here. And saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Something very powerful is happening here. Okay? Something very powerful is happening here. I'm not going to get into all the details so I can get it through this message here this morning, but this here. Stephen basically is going against the grain. He's basically going against the grain of what so many Jewish people were used to living by the law, right? And this is the thing. Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom and everything else, preaches a message in chapter 6. All of chapter 6 is basically the message that he preaches. Okay? What he basically does is he's holding their feet to the fire. He's rebuking them. What he's basically doing is calling them out and saying, this Jesus, you know, the interesting thing is about uh, Acts chapter 6, if you want to write this down and look at it, Acts chapter 6, he never mentions the name of Jesus Christ when he's preaching. The closest that he comes is by saying the just one. But he never mentions the name of Christ, which is interesting. They knew exactly who he was talking about. It says here in uh, chapter number 7, it says, it says, uh, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. 
the God of uh, glory appear unto our father, or I'm sorry, not chapter, uh, wait, I'm in the wrong chapter here, I think. Wait a second here. Give me one second here. I think I might have, uh, okay, no, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 7 is where he uh, preaches the message that's rebuking the, basically the religious zealots of the day. That's where in Acts chapter 7, that's basically where he starts preaching, um, basically about Moses, about Pharaoh, uh, Egypt, and basically the children of Israel being delivered out of Egypt, and he basically goes into all the details of that, basically, and basically is rebuking them, and basically now in uh, verse number here it says, in uh, verse number... Uh, where am I at here? Verse number 51 of Acts chapter 7, verse 51, it says this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which have showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So basically what's happening here is this, in a nutshell, as I said before. Basically he's rebuking the religious zealots of the day, right? Trying to keep people under the law when now the grace of Christ is now present here, okay? The first thing I want to show you here is this. I'm going to preach to you this morning about valuing the Lord, okay? Valuing the Lord in your, with your walk with Christ. Adding some value to your walk with Christ. And the first thing that I want to show you here is this. Stephen had to do a self-examination. Okay? Stephen had to get himself at a point in his walk with the Lord where he had to take a look at himself. Because the Bible says that they were of honest report. When Stephen was appointed a deacon at that point, all right, back in Acts chapter 6 here, uh, it says here, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And it says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So Stephen is also the first man that they appoint to this position full of the Holy Ghost, and of an honest report, right? I want you to think about what they're basically seeing here in Stephen. A man who basically has showed himself to be true, right? A self-examination when, when valuing your walk with the Lord, all right? This is what I want you to think about here. Self-examination means this, all right? When it comes to adding value to our walk with Jesus Christ, the first thing that we have to do when it comes to examining, or, uh, examining ourselves is we have to learn how to deny this flesh. We have to learn how to, de how to deny this flesh. Romans chapter 8. Turn there if you would. I'm going to point out some scripture to you here this morning. In Romans chapter 8, and it says here, Romans chapter 8, and look at verse number 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, when it comes to self-examination, the one thing that, that Stephen had to learn how to do, to be able to be appointed to be a deacon in the very beginning stages of the church age, right? All these things that are happening, the Word of God was increasing. People were coming to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, right? We see this happening here. And this is the thing. When there comes a point in everyone's walk to grow and add value to your walk with Christ, you have to learn how to deny that flesh. Because that flesh will get in the way every single time. When it comes to self-examination, the, the, the one thing that the flesh does not like is being called out. Amen. The flesh does not like being called out. Okay? There's a, a testimony of, of a gentleman, actually a uh, rock and roll guy, that I've actually uh, uh, seen the testimony of. 
online, and he uh, basically um, he basically talks about how the, how he came to Christ at one point in his life, and that his biggest and toughest addiction in his life is music. It's rock and roll. And you will probably know the name if I said it to you, but his name is slipping me at the moment right now. But he's basically a lead singer of a big rock and roll band. His, and he talks about in his interview how his dad and his uncle and his, I think it was his father-in-law are all preachers and evangelists. His uncle was an evangelist. His dad was a preacher. And I think his uncle was a preacher, something like that. He's got ministers in his family. He says... He says, I don't go around necessarily preaching the gospel to people. He says, but if people come to me and ask me about my faith, he says, I'm more than happy to tell you about it. He says, but my biggest and strongest addiction in my life, the hardest thing I have to overcome is rock and roll music, right? And that's the thing when it comes to self-examination, when you want to add some value to your walk with the Lord, a self-examination, the flesh does not like being called out, all right? I want you to look at something here in Romans chapter 8. It says this. It says uh, in uh, Romans 8, 5, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You see what that, what that Bible says there? For they, that are of the fle- for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In verse number 8 here it says this, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What is he basically talking about? He's basically talking about this. Christians that give into the flesh over the Spirit. Christians that when they do a self-examination of their flesh, when they look at their life in the flesh, right? What things that they're doing, are you pleasing God in your walk? Or could you add a little bit of value to it? If you want to add value to your walk with Christ, have a closer walk with Him, there comes a point when you have to look at your own life and do a self-examination, and guess what that means? Calling the flesh out for what it's doing or what maybe it's getting in the way of doing, right? The Bible says to be carnally minded is to be at enmity with God. Does that make sense to you? I'm getting some blank stares here. Does that make sense this morning? Yeah? Okay. Okay. And it says in verse number 8 again, it says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. He's not talking about, we're all in the flesh in the sense that we're we're walking in flesh. That's not what he's talking. He's talking about the fact that a Christian who continues to to basically fulfill the lusts of the flesh is basically what he's talking about here. Continues to take heed to the flesh rather than taking heed to the Spirit of God in him. Okay? And it says this in verse number 9. It says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, if you're born again, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Christ, the Holy Spirit of Christ is within you. And if he's bidding you to do something differently, to examine yourself, if, if the Spirit's calling you out, it's calling the flesh out on something, do a self-examination of whatever he is he's pointing out to you. And I'll tell you this, it's not a fun place to be. It's not fun when the flesh gets called out because the flesh does not like to be called out for what it's doing. Because the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. They're at enmity with each other. The flesh and the Spirit, they do not like each other. That's that battle we have going on, the spiritual battle that we all have going on. That's why there's still sin present in our lives, because we're still battling the flesh. When we don't witness to somebody because we're afraid of what they're going to say to us or rejecting us, that's giving in to the flesh. When you, give, when you are a witness to somebody, that's giving in to the Spirit of God. When you're in your Bible reading it and studying it, that's giving in to the Spirit of God. When you're reading about Oprah or whatever other health books are out there, whatever, you name it. You name it. If you esteem every other book out there above the Bible, you're giving in to the flesh. That's, true. that's what you're doing. And that's what he's talking about here. Is giving in to the flesh over the Spirit. And you cannot live, you cannot walk a righteous walk with the Lord if we continue to give in to the flesh over the Spirit. They lust, they lust against each other. Amen. It's just like when you eat dessert over eating broccoli. Which one's healthier for you? Obviously broccoli is healthier for you. I love steamed broccoli, by the way. Okay, but guess what? Guess what tastes better? Guess what looks better? Key lime pie, doesn't it? Ooh, yeah, right? 
Okay, that's that flesh and spirit kind of thing going on there, right? You have the, 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 the what is that, the dog on there, the devil and the horns, and on this side of your shoulder, you have the angel on this side, and they're both going at each other back and forth, right? Do this, don't do that, right? Go to church on Sunday morning. The flesh says, I don't want to, I want to stay in bed where it's comfortable. Read your Bible. Nah. At what point in our life, what is the Lord dealing with you about? With Stephen, let me tell you something. Stephen had to come to a point in his life where he had to do a self-examination of himself and he had to look at himself and say, okay, what am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? What am I doing or what am I not doing that I should be doing? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Can I get a witness here? Okay, okay. I just want to make sure I'm keeping you guys on the same page. I've had to jump around here a little bit this morning and I apologize for that. Okay, it says here in verse number 11, it says, But if the Spirit of Him, or in Romans chapter 8, verse number 11, it says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after, or not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit, you do mortify the deeds, um, the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For, even, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, oh, there we go talking about children again, okay? And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Again, who do you give in to, the Spirit or the flesh? There's that battle that keeps going back and forth, isn't it, right? Self-examination, right? Uh, let's see here, let me... Go to, uh, let's see here if I should touch on this or not. Let's see here. Let me see. Let's go on to uh, Matthew chapter 16. Jump over to Matthew chapter 16 here. Matthew chapter 16. It says this. Christ speaking here, it says this. In verse 24, he says, Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man, any man, will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. And take up, take up his cross and do what? Follow me. You know what? Sometimes we don't always know what that means. Have you ever been in that moment that zealous part of your Christian life when you told the Lord, Lord, I'm going to do anything you tell me to do. If you want me to go and serve over in Africa, that's what I'm going to do. Not realizing that he may actually call you to serve over in Africa. And then when he does, you're like, well, wait a second here. Just like when God called Jonah to Nineveh to preach. What did he do? He ran from God, didn't he? You know, and I heard an interesting message about that too, and I won't get too deep into that here this morning because time is flying by here this morning, but you know what? Jonah, like us, when things don't sound very pleasing, we think that if we just ignore it, the call's going to go away. The call doesn't go away. Sometimes you have to learn that the hard way. If God tells you to do something, plans don't change. It may just take longer for his will to be done, right? God calls you to preach, guess what? Preach. If God calls you to be missionary, be a missionary, right? Because again, it ain't about you and I, right? It's easy to preach. There's another thing to live by it, right? Okay, verse 24 or 25, it says, For whosoever shall take, shall sa will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? Oh, here comes the good stuff right here. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? People will joke around. 
I hear people joke around about it. I'm like, if only you knew what you were joking about, pal. People jokingly say, you know what, I would sell my soul to the devil if it meant that I could have all this kind of money. It's like, well, then you're just like Hollywood then. You're just like a lot of Hollywood. They've basically sold their soul to the devil in a sense, right? You know what the sad thing is about some of those folks up in Hollywood? Some of those folks, not many, but some, very few, actually have a testimony. They actually have a testimony of salvation, believe it or not. And there's one gentleman who I had heard about recently, and I won't go into too much detail because I don't know enough about it yet, who apparently is, from the sounds of it, maybe coming out of the pop world of music because Christ has called him out of it, claims to be a Christian. We'll see what fruit produces from that. I think it's a possibility because there are some names here this morning I could list off to you. You'd probably know the names of them. The adults in here would probably know. They actually have a testimony, right? People that I used to listen to back in my other days, and guess what? I had no idea, right? I want to share this illustration with you real quick about self-examination, right? It says this. Do you have a hunger for God? If we don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because we have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because we have, it's because we have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Our soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. If we are full of what the world offers, then perhaps a fast might express or even increase our soul's appetite for God. Between the dangers of self-denial and self-indulgence is the path of pleasant, pla pleasant pain called fasting. Self-examination. The next thing I want to show you here is this. We'll be done here shortly here. All right? I won't keep you guys too long here this morning. If you would go back to Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 6. Oops. Acts chapter 6 here. I want to show you the next thing that Stephen ends up doing when it comes to valuing his walk with the Lord, how he viewed Christ himself, all right? And it says here in uh, Acts chapter, let's see here, Acts chapter uh, 6, and look down at, um, let's look down at number 11 again. It says, Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Basically what they were doing at this point they were basically trying to set up false witnesses against him. They were causing men to go speak false witnessing against Stephen, basically saying that he was doing something he wasn't doing, essentially, is what they were trying to do, trying to get him into trouble, okay? And it says here in verse number 12, it says, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and, caught, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And, uh, and all they that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Acts chapter 7, it says, then, the, then said the high priest, are these things so? All right? Now I want you to go through and, uh, at the end of chapter 7 here towards uh, uh, verse number, uh, back to first, uh, verse number 51 of Acts 7, it says this. I'm going to skim over all this so we don't uh, get caught up in this for too long here. It says in 51, ye stiff-necked and, uncir and uncircumcised in heart. This is Stephen calling them out, okay? The religious zealots of the day that were rejecting Christ, that were rejecting the Messiah. He said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, now this is the counsel of the people, the religious elders of the day that heard these things, right? They, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing, not sitting, but standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast, upon, or cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. You know who that is. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, 
laid not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The second thing I want to show you here is this, that he esteemed Christ more than himself. There came a point with Stephen when he looked at what was going on. He looked at the religious elders and how basically they hated everything he was saying. They were cut to the heart. They were gnashing on him with their teeth. They were looking at, they were listening to what he said, and he knew something was going to happen, right? And basically at this point here, there came a crossroads for Stephen. What do I do? Some Christians may find it more comforting to flee and leave the area, get out of there as quickly as possible, leave, right? But Stephen stuck with it. Stephen stuck with it, and he looked at his relationship with the Lord as being so important, so valuable. He esteemed Christ higher than himself, and that's why he stuck with that thing, right? He valued his relationship with Christ. Now, it's one thing to have a relationship with the Lord. It's one thing to go to church on Sundays. It's one thing to, to, um, to go through the, if you will, the religious circle, a repetition, if you will, going to church on Sundays, hearing the preaching of the Word of God, going back home on Sunday, and then calling it quits for the week or whatever the case is, right? It's one thing to be going to church. It's another thing to be completely sold out to the Lord. It's another thing to be so, to esteem Him that much higher in our life that we put aside the things that we want, our desires of the flesh, right? To esteem Him higher than ourselves. And I'll tell you this, it can be a tough thing to do, can't it? It can be a tough thing to do sometimes. But I'll tell you what, Stephen, his feet were put to the fire, and guess what he did? He succeeded. His feet were put to the fire, and he succeeded. Because of his value for the Lord, he viewed the Lord that highly in his life. It wasn't just a thing that he did. He didn't just go to church on Sundays and then go back to work Monday through Friday and then come back to church again on Sundays and wear some nice clothes, come to church. It wasn't like that. It was a real relationship with him. Your relationship with your kids, with your spouse, is that not a real relationship? Do you not give for your spouse? Husbands, don't we like to give for our children? We like to give for our wives. Wives, don't you like to give for your husbands? Give for your friends, right? It's a real relationship you have with that person. The same thing with Jesus Christ. When the, your relationship is that real with him and to him, guess what? You esteem him more than you do yourself. What things you want to do, you put on the back burner, right? Hopefully you're getting a blessing out of the message here this morning, Amen. all right? Romans chapter 12, I'm going to show you something else here. Romans chapter 12, and it says this. Romans chapter 12, you don't have to turn that if you don't want to for the sake of time here, but Romans chapter 12, and it says this here, 1 through 3, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your what? Your bodies. Your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? What does he say that it is? A reasonable service. It's the least that we can do. Amen. The least that a Christian can do, the least that we can do, is present these bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Go where he tells us to go. Do what he wants us to do. You want me to go to Bible school? Then I'll go to Bible school. You want me to be a missionary? Then I'll go be a missionary. Even though I have no idea how you're going to provide. You know what I heard a preacher just say this recently? He said, if God guides, God's going to provide. If God guides, God's going to provide. If God calls you to it, he's going to, call you, he's going to get you through it. Right? It says this here, it says, be not conformed to this world. In uh, Romans uh, thir uh, 12, 2, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do I know what God wants for me in this life? How, you know, Stephen probably asked himself that question at one point too. He probably said, Lord, what, what do you want with my life? What do you want me to do for you? And you know what the Lord is calling him to do? He lay his life down for him. He put his feet to the fire. Stephen had a golden opportunity. I'll tell you what, Stephen got the chance to see Christ like nobody else got to see him. Amen. Stephen was put a place in his life where he got to see Christ up there standing on the right hand of God. Amen. And he saw him. I can't imagine what that would have been like. Imagine being under some severe persecution. I mean, you know you're about to be killed. That's how severe this was, okay? And he says, I don't care. 
You can take my life. That's what I'm looking at up there. Amen. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I have my eyes on right there. And he looked at Christ standing on the right hand of God. Man, that would have been a sight to see. You know how he saw that? Because of his, because one, he did a self-examination of himself. He esteemed Christ higher than himself. He gave himself as a living sacrifice for God. And he was obedient to the faith Amen. all the way to the death. Yep. Hang in there with me, all right? We'll be done here just shortly. Famous last words of any Baptist preacher, right? <laughs> all right. It says here uh, in Romans 12, 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to give you a warning. Young people, older people, I want to give you a warning. Older people know all about this, okay? I want to give you a warning. The world is going to try to play tricks on your head or play tricks in your mind, okay? The world wants you to think that everything that you're doing for Christ or for your religion is a waste of time because they're going to keep attacking Christianity. If there was nothing to Christianity, they would leave it alone. They leave Muslims alone. They leave Muslims alone, don't they? Workplaces will even provide worship rugs for Muslims. Isn't that something? That's where we're at in America today, right? Muslims have more respect than what Christians do today. Isn't that something? So guess what we do? We say, you know what? That's how real this thing is. There's something to it. If they don't like it, it's because there's something to it. If they don't like it, there's something to it. There's something convicting about it. You can walk into a room just the way that you present yourself. You don't have to say anything about the Lord. Just the way you present yourself. People will know there's something different about you. Right? Mm -hmm. Just the way you present yourself. Maybe the way your family dresses. The way your family acts. How your family treats each other. Your kids actually behave. Imagine that. Imagine you guys behaving, right? Isn't that something? <laughs> Looks like you guys smacked them the heather. See, that's, all, that's what happens if you don't behave right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? But I want to give you a warning about the world. They're always going to try to play tricks on the Christians. Amen. Oh, where, hey, where is this coming of Jesus that you Christians talk about? You really think that God's going to destroy this entire world? I'll tell you what. He did it with the flood. And there's evidence of the flood out there if you're open to seeing it. I've seen evidence of it. It's pretty incredible, actually. Right? All right. Let me share this story with you real quick here, all right? It says this. This is a, uh, a quote, actually, from, uh, from i got to say the name right, Charles Spurgeon. I almost said Dave Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, okay? He says this. Doth not all nature around me praise God? If I were silent, I should be an exception to the universe. Doth not the thunder praise him as it rolls like drums in the march of the God of, of armies? Do not the mountains praise him when the woods upon their summits wave in adoration? Doth not the lightning write his name in letters of fire? Hath not the whole earth a voice? And shall I, can I, silent be? I saw that quote. I thought, man, if all nature praises God, the Amen. least that I can do is op offer up a praise to God every now and then. Amen? Amen. I'm going to give you one more thing here this morning and we'll be done. All right? Just bear with me. The last thing I want to show you is this. In Acts chapter 7, one other thing that we see here is this. Not only did, did Stephen do a self-examination, and not only did he, did, he, did he esteem Christ higher than himself, but he, like I said a few minutes ago, he got to experience Christ like nobody else did. When you're that close to God, you experience him in ways that nobody else does. Let me give you an example of this here, what I'm talking about with Stephen here, okay? If you go through a tragedy in your life, you lose somebody close to you. You, lose a, you, you go through a tragedy in your life. Let's say, let's say a, a pastor loses his wife. I can't imagine how tough that would be. I don't even want to think about it. 
But let's just say a pastor loses his wife. So many people will look at that and say, I don't know how you can do it. I look at the scriptures and I say, I know how he can do it. Because he's experiencing Christ like nobody else is. There is a closeness with the Lord that you get to experience when God calls you to something like that that nobody else around you can understand. I've known people that have gone through some stuff When I was uh, a senior in high school, lost, on my way to hell, I got a phone call that my sister had been diagnosed with stage 4 melanoma cancer. And I'll tell you what, it was at that point in my life when I felt like a brick wall had slammed into me. Because you, he- you hear about things like that happening to other people, but you never think it's going to happen to you. She ended up losing her battle to cancer. I got to tell her I loved her one last time before she died. But I also know she's up in heaven, too. We made sure of that. And some people look at that and say, I don't know how you can go through that and survive something like that, or losing a child. My mom lost a daughter. My mom watched her come into the world and watched her leave the world. Okay? I, I hope that upon nobody to watch your own child leave this world, Right? especially that young woman. She was 32 when she died, okay? But I think about that, and I look at Stephen, what he went through, and you know what? This is the thing. He was totally sold out for Christ. And because he was sold out to Christ, he got to experience Christ on a supernatural level. If the Lord calls you to go through something, can I encourage you with something this morning? And I have no idea what you're going through this morning. I have no clue. But can I encourage you here this morning with this? If you're going through something right now that you think is unbearable, you don't know how in the world you're going to get through it, can I, can I give you a promise from the Bible here? The Lord's going to get you through it. He will get you through it. And you're going to get to experience Him on a level that other people you know may have never got to experience Him like. There are some things in life that just don't make sense. But God has a master plan, right? He's the potter, we're the clay, right? Stephen got to experience Christ like nobody else did. And you know what I find amazing about this? Not only was he sold out for Christ, but I'll tell you something else he was able to do. Read down in verse number 59. It says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. He was being stoned by the very people. Be honest with you. He was trying to see get saved, if you will, right? He was trying to see some people get get right with the Lord, if you will, right? He's trying to rebuke them, call them out for what they were doing. Wrong. And he says this, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Look at verse number 60. And he kneeled down. As they're stoning him, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, He wasn't crying for mercy. He was crying out to God. Cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Who else said that? Jesus Christ said that. See what happens when you get to experience Christ that closely in your life? There is a peace, there is a comfort in your life that only Christ can give you. Right? Right? being able to pray for your enemies. I found as, as I've grown in my walk with the Lord, I've, one of the things that the Lord has taught me how to do, and this may be simple for a lot of people in here, but for me it's been a challenge over the years. But one of the things that the Lord's dealt with me about is praying for my enemies, praying for those people that have hurt me in the past. Because you know why? They don't know what they are doing. They don't understand it. For me to get mad at my enemies is unfair to them. Because this life that I'm living is not about me. You hurt me. Get over it. Okay? People are going to hurt you. They're going to burn you. They're going to do that. How many people have you burned in your life? How many bridges bridges have you burned in your life? And people let you come back and rebuild that bridge with them. Don't let people burn their bridges with you and keep it burned down. Do your best to let them rebuild that bridge with you. Right? Right? Pray for your enemies. It doesn't mean you have to be friends with them again. 
but at least pray for them. The fact that Stephen is able to pray for his enemies as he's being killed speaks volumes about his character and who he was. I've got one more quote here I want to share with you, and then we'll close down with this. Persistence in prayer for someone whom we don't like, however much it goes against the grain to begin with, brings about a remarkable change in attitude. Amen. Think about that. Persistence in prayer for someone whom we don't like, however much it goes against the grain to begin with, brings about a remarkable change in attitude. When I pray for somebody that I've struggled with, maybe somebody in my past that's burned me pretty heavily, I find that when I pray for them, I have a peace that only Christ can give me. Because it's not my problem. Amen? Amen. Bow our heads and I'll close out with a word of prayer here. I'm going to open up the altar this morning. Not forcing anybody to come up here by any means, but if the Lord has dealt with you about something here this morning, maybe a self-examination, maybe esteeming Christ or experiencing Christ on a level that nobody else but you can experience. I want to encourage you this morning as the altar is open to come up here. Give it to the Lord. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Just a few more minutes here. And whatever the Lord may be dealing with you about, I would encourage you this morning, brethren. I would encourage you to talk to him about that thing. I'd encourage you to lay it at his feet. Maybe you're burdened with a load of bitterness in your life. And maybe the flesh just loves that bitterness because then you can, you know, hold on to it and you think that the other person's hurting when it's really just you hurting. So maybe it's bitterness the Lord's trying to call out in your life. Maybe it's self-pride. You know, if you're going to do anything like what Stephen did, and be totally sold out for Christ, there are some things God is going to reveal about you of who you are, character-wise. And that's one of the things that I appreciate about the Lord. He knows me better than I know myself, and He'll allow me to go through some trials and challenges so that I can learn some things about who I am, because He knows who I am. But He's got to teach me who I am. So maybe you're struggling with bitterness or whatever it may be this morning.